Now, uh, this is the last of the three lectures. And in my first lecture, I had discussed uh, Ghaffar Khan uh, or Bacha Khan's creation of an organization of non-violent resistors known as the Kodai Khidmatkars, literally servants of God. A non-violent army of non-violent resistors is a novel idea. And I would go so far as to say that every society may indeed need one such army of non-violent resistors because a fundamental problem is not simply war crimes. And they're very much being discussed today. Uh, as I'm sure some of you are aware, uh, Ukraine has already commenced war crime trials against Russian soldiers. And I have little doubt that Russia will probably do the same. Uh, with much less cause than Ukraine to do so. Uh, writing in Foreign Affairs in January 1947 on the Nuremberg war crimes trial as a landmark in law, Henry L. Stimson, who had served as Roosevelt's Secretary of State, concluded his article with the observation that, quote, the central problem is war and not its methods and that a continuance of war will in all probability end with the destruction of our civilization. So I think it's very emphatically clear that you can have people tried for war crimes. And as you know, one of the, one of the things that Nuremberg did was it introduced a whole new series of crimes which did not actually exist in the law at that point, including crimes against peace and crimes against humanity and also, of course, conspiracy uh, to have a war of aggression. Um, of course, this is not the occasion to get into New the Nuremberg war trials, but rather to suggest simply that Ghaffar Khan's idea of uh, an army of nonviolent resistors is an idea that needs to take fruit in every society, because I don't really foresee any other possibility of an end to war. Uh, for 2,000 years, we've been thinking that we, have, we are becoming more evolved as human beings, as, as ethical creatures, and there is very little evidence to suggest that that is the case. If anything, we seem to have descended into greater and greater barbarities, beginning with the concept of total war about 100, 125 years ago, and moving, of course, into nuclear war, including the barbarisms that are associated with the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In my second lecture on the architecture of the street as a site of protest around the world, I considered how a new language of nonviolent protest has been carved out in places such as Hong Kong and Myanmar. And I pointed to the semiotics of such protest. In this, the final lecture, I want to consider how the Shaheen Bagh movement is yet another and perhaps most significant chapter in the still unfolding history of Satyagraha. It is a chapter in the history of Satyagraha, critically important at least in India, perhaps in all Muslim societies, even those which unlike India are Muslim majority states, and indeed critical I think for the rest of the world. However, I want to begin with three considerations that constitute a critical background to the Shaheen Bagh movement. And that these three considerations will take up the first half of my remarks today. And then in the second half, in about roughly 25, 30 minutes, I will speak about the Shaheen Bagh movement and share some Im images with you as well. I had originally thought I would also talk about art. I will show quite a few murals in quick succession, but I, but the but the talk really is focused more. It's on Shaheen Bagh, of course, but it's all, it's focused also on Muslim nationalist politics and the gender of protest. Right. So, uh, because I want to suggest, of course, that Shaheen Bagh is, as I've said, uh, a not simply a continuation of the methods of Satyagraha, but it's a new history in the chapter of nonviolence. And, and that is what I was attempting to do in the first two lectures as well, is to, is to see how we can move forward with the idea of nonviolence. First, let me be very clear. 
that this talk is not intended as a full-fledged narrative of the Shaheen Bagh movement, and even less as a discussion, at least not a full-fledged discussion of the CAA, NRC, NPR, and the full implications of this triad. Nevertheless, we do need some understanding of the CAA, NRC, NPR triad. The CAA refers, of course, to the Citizenship Amendment Act. The NRC is the National Register of Citizens, and the NPR is a National Population Register. And here I have to apologize to those who already know all of this, but I'm sure that there are some listeners, you know, I know a few people who are um, joining from some other parts of the world who may not be familiar with all these acronyms. Uh, in India, we have a very particular fondness for uh, acronyms, and you can read newspaper headlines which have four acronyms in one single headline. So if you don't know the acronyms, you really can't make head or tail of what they're saying. Uh, but as I've explained what these acronyms are, the CEA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, NPR, the National Population Register. The CEA was passed by the parliament and signed into law by the president of India on 11th December 2019, and that is what will precipitate the Shaheen Bagh movement. And at this juncture, let me say immediately that when I speak of the Shaheen Bagh movement, I'm not only speaking, of course, I'll get into this in greater detail later on, I'm not only speaking of the dadis, the grandmothers, the other women of Shaheen Bagh itself, but I'm also speaking of the associated protests, including the fact that Shaheen Bagh itself became, while it was a very much a stationary site, it also became very much a mobile site. There were Shaheen Baghs that sprung up everywhere around India. But I'm also speaking of what happened at Jamia and the movement at Jamia uh, and the student movement more broadly around that period of time, late December, moving into the first quarter of 2020 before the coronavirus pandemic. Um, uh, entirely changed the situation, uh, and we'll see how uh, later on. The NRC is, the C so the CA was passed, uh, as I said, on 11th December 2019. The NRC is a proposed measure, and some suspect that the NPR, National Population Register, is a prelude to it, though the government has sought to de-link the National Population Register, or NPR, from the National Register of Citizens. In October 2021, the Union Cabinet approved 3,900 crore rupees for a NPR, and Kerala and West Bengal governments have announced that they will not implement the NPR. However, let it be noted that citizenship, aliens, and naturalization are subject matters listed in List 1 of the seventh schedule to the Indian constitution over which parliament has exclusive jurisdiction. And in law, at least states have no say in whether they can implement or rule out the NPR. The Shaheen Bagh movement was at least prima facie a response to the passage of the CAA. What then is the NPR? The home ministry says it is a list of quote, the usual residents of the country. And a usual resident is defined as one who has been residing in a local area for at least the last six months or intends to stay in a particular location for the next six months. A foreign national staying in an area would, for six months or more would thus be enumerated in the NPR. And thus, in principle, the NPR has no intrinsic relationship to claims of citizenship. The NRC on the other hand, identifies and excludes non-citizens. The authority to prepare the NPR is derived from the Citizenship Act of 1955 and the Citizenship Rules of 2003. And the NPR has a mandate to require every usual resident of India to be registered under the NPR. Assam is excluded from this exercise since the NRC has already been concluded in that state some time ago. The NPR is not contrary to some expressed views, a novel exercise. It was in fact carried out even in 2010 as part of the house listing phase of the 2011 census. 
The NRC does not logically follow the NPR, but of course the exercise of carrying out an NRC could use the NPR as a base, weeding out the non-citizens from the NPR to derive an NRC, right? So, you know, just in case someone here is getting a little bit lost, let me just say very briefly, just think of it this way. NPR is simply, you might say, a kind of a census of how many people there are, provided these are people who have stayed in one place or have a fixed address for a minimum period of six months. The NRC is, and, and that NPR has no necessary relationship to citizenship. The NRC is a register of citizens. Of course, the question still remains, how is citizenship determined? The Home Ministry, and the question is whether if you have an NPR, whether that is necessarily a prelude to NRC. The Home Ministry and Amit Shah have repeatedly declared that NPR data would not be used to create the NRC. However, the government and ministers in high positions, among them the Home Minister Amit Shah, have issued contrary statements about this many times. For instance, in November 2014, the then Minister of State for Home had told the Rajya Sabha in a written reply to a CPI MP, quote, the NPR is the first step towards creation of National Register of Indian Citizens by verifying the citizenship status of every usual resident. The annual report of the Home Ministry for 2018-19 likewise affirmed, and I quote, the NPR is a first step towards the creation of the National Register of Indian Citizens under the provisions of the aforementioned statute, that is Citizenship Act. And uh, the web portal scroll actually ran an article after the protests had started, some months after the protests had started, enumerate, enumerating at least five instances where the Home Minister had more or less said that the NPR is going to lead to the NRC. What is most germane is that in the anti-CA protests, the NPR, NRC, and CAA were all linked together. Whatever the distinction sought to be made by the state and repeated attempts to suggest that the three are not related, protesters throughout India have thought otherwise. And here, let me sh share with you very momentarily, just for a moment, a screen, um, which for some strange reason is not showing up right now. Usually it does. So just uh, allow me a minute, please, while I see why the screen is not showing up. Um, uh, of a, this is a PowerPoint that I have. Um, All right, we'll see if we'll see if I'm able to share it now. Uh, I hope so, but uh, let me see. Yeah, here it is. All right, um, and I will have to go to a different view of this slideshow. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, my apologies that somehow, as I said, it didn't show up. So here you can see this is this is a uh, this is a, a, a one of many murals. I'll share some of these murals later on. But you can see that 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 whatever the stated position of the of the Indian government, I'm saying very simply that in the minds of protesters, these three were linked together. So no CA, no NPR, no NRC. This is a mural uh, which is from. Um, um, the area outside uh, Jamia. Uh, these murals don't exist any longer. Um, 
and and some of them are are you know have been shown by many others and some of them you can find easily on youtube uh, 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 these were photographed by me there are going to be a few images i which have been shared with me with uh, by someone whom um, i cannot identify uh, including some videos uh, uh, for uh, you know security purposes as it were but uh, but this uh, here, here you can see here that uh, this uh, this uh, a little, uh, you know, uh, artwork, and there were hundreds of such artworks, hundreds, literally thousands, perhaps, uh, which were to be found in the Shaheen Bag area, and in the particularly, particularly in uh, in the Shaheen Bag area, and some in the Jamia area as well, where Gandhi is, uh, you know, carrying a little banner, uh, and it's crossed out, C A A um, uh, N P R N N R C, uh, and here, here the policeman is saying, look at his cl cloth, he must be Vikas. So this is a reference to a remark that Modi had made that you can recognize the protesters by what they're wearing, which was of course uh, a remark about the fact that, well, you can recognize you know, who the protesters are because they're Muslims quite evidently. And so uh, you know, uh, it's very clear uh, uh, who's behind uh, these, uh, these protests and so on. Uh, here, and here again, you can see no CA, no NRC. So all of these were, as I said, very much linked in the minds uh, of the of the protesters. It is also necessary to understand that the NPR, though linked in the anti-CA protest to the NRC and the CA itself, should also be viewed as one of several initiatives among which is the Aadhaar card to bring every person, citizen and non-citizen alike, under the purview of the state. The ostensible objectives of these exercises is to find a way to transfer government benefits to citizens. As a home ministry has noted, the objective of conducting NPR is to quote, prepare a credible register of every family and individual living in the country, apart from strengthening security and improvement in targeting of beneficial. In this particular quest, initially the proponents of the Aadhaar card won the day. However, the idea for NPR was then revived a few years ago. The NPR collects both demographic and biometric data, relying largely on Aadhaar for the latter. Among the demographic data, and note this very carefully, it seeks information on the date and place of birth of parents, of parents, right? And so we will we'll understand momentarily what is the significance of this. With regards to the CAA itself, its immediate origins lie in the Citizenship Amendment Bill 2016, which was designed to amend the Citizenship Act of 1955 to recognize specific types of illegal immigrants segregated by religion and country of origin. It was enacted on December 11, 2019. The Shaheen, Shaheen Bagh movement started four days later. It was enacted, the CA, on December 11, 2019, as the Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA. Under the CAA, Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Jains, Parsis, and Sikhs. Note the adherence of these six religions. Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Jains, Parsis, and Sikhs. Here listed in alphabetical order who had migrated from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or Pakistan to India prior to 2014 are no longer considered illegal immigrants and can more readily achieve citizenship. They are, to put it colloquially, put on the fast track to citizenship. On one point of view, prima facie, prima facie, there is nothing that is objectionable as such to the act. It could be argued that by some people. If let's say that a Muslim objects that it leaves out Muslims from the track to citizenship, the rejoinder of course would be that the CAA guarantees religious minorities in Muslim majority states, those states being Afghanistan, Bangladesh or Pakistan. Right? The, the bill doesn't say that minorities, religious minor, mi minorities may come from other states and be given fast track to citizenship. It doesn't say that. Only from neighboring Muslim majority states. The minority is coming from those states, right? So if a Muslim objects that it leaves out Muslims from the track to citizenship, 
The rejoinder would be that the CA guarantees religious minorities in Muslim majority states the sanctity of refuge and citizenship in India. Why would Muslims need refuge and citizenship in India, given that they are the majority in the state from which they seek to come to India, if there were such Muslims, right? And of course, someone would then, by way of rejoinder, say, well, how about the Shias and the Qadianis or Ahmadiyas, the other name by which they're known, right? We know, for example, that in Pakistan, uh, in Afghanistan, there have been numerous attacks on Shias uh, establishments, on Shia mosques, on madrasas run by Shias, and on Shias themselves by the dominant Sunnis. So clearly, one could argue that the Shias are under persecution as well in these countries. Are they not minorities? From the standpoint of the Indian government, one could at least in principle argue that differences among Muslims is a matter for Muslim majority states to sort out amongst themselves. Moreover, I am sure that some people will argue, and I think we need to be aware of these arguments. We must do what, of course, in Indian philosophy is called the Purva Paksh, which is you anticipate all the objections to the argument you're going to make, right? Do not, moreover, do not the states of the West similarly privilege Christians over non-Christians in deciding what refugees to accept? Just consider for a moment what has happened apropos of the refugees from Ukraine. Now there are 3 million Ukrainian refugees outside Ukraine in the course of the last three months since the war started, just a little bit less than three months. The total number of people who are displaced in Ukraine, that is internally displaced persons, is an additional 7 million, but they're not refugees. And notice how quickly the states of the West have accepted, including countries such as Poland, which if I may say so, never really had any tradition of offering hospitality to Ukrainians. If anything, they always turned them away and now they're receiving them with open arms. And we know, for ex we know by contrast what has happened to Muslim refugees who have sought admission into European countries. Other than Germany, most of these European countries have been in exceedingly miserly in accepting Muslims. Exceedingly miserly, right? Likewise with the United States. So clearly someone could argue that what the Citizenship Amendment Act is really doing is no different than what in fact actually most of the states of the West, which all describe themselves with a few exceptions as, as secular democratic states, that that's exactly what they do, right? So on what grounds then did Muslims start objecting to the CAA? And this is where we need the history of the NPR and the NRC, because what I have argued thus far about the CAA, NRC, and NPR linkage furnishes quite obviously the reasons why the passage of the CAA was the catalyst for the anxiety, unrest, and the protests that are encapsulated under what is called the Shaheen Bag. If Muslims were not accommodated within the CAA, might they not also be accommodated within the NRC? That's the question. Right? How are they going to establish their citizenship? So would, if they are, quote, discriminated against under the provisions of CA, might they not also similarly, under some subterfuge, some pretext, be similarly discriminated against the NRC? Now, protests against the CA had an early start in Northeast India, especially in Assam, where, of course, the issue is not simply one of religion. It is also the question of ethnicity, but that's a different, very complex subject, which I will not enter into at all. Secondly, by way of these larger considerations, a brief foray into the history of Muslim nationalist politics in India will help to underscore the unique significance of the Shaheen Bagh movement. It is important that we begin with some understanding of the place of Muslims in the political life of India. The emergence of elite Muslims into the political life of modern India can, of course, be traced to Sir Saeed Ahmad Khan, 
who lived from 1817 to 1898, an educationist, Islamic reform, reformer, and one of the progenitors of Muslim nationalism in India. He is, of course, perhaps most eminently associated with the founding of the Mohammedan Anglo-Indian Oriental College in 1875, later transformed into the Aligarh Muslim University, AMU, in 1919. And Sir, Sahim, uh, Sir Saeed Ahmed Khan had, had you know, many interests in, in, in uh, coming forward with this initiative. Um, he looked very much to the West, partly because he thought of Islam, of course, as a Semitic religion that shared Semitic roots um, uh, with the, the Judeo-Christian West. Um, he was also very keen, as uh, I think the work of a number of scholars has shown, uh, I think David Lelewald's book, which is now uh, Aligarh's first generation, which is now, I think, about almost four, some decades old, is still, I think, the most interesting study of its kind, uh, that Sir Saeed Ahmed Khan was interested in making Muslims proper subjects of the colonial state. Um, and, of course, what he also sought to do was to bring them into the mainstream of Indian life. The reformist Urdu critic Altaf Hussein Hali is uh, also interesting to consider. He writes in a very colonial vein, the following passage where he describes how Muslims after having come to India had become indolent. They had been emasculated almost. I mean, and he's writing very much like, let's say an 18th century, 19th century colonial writer might write about Indians as a whole. Quote, you have turned lions into sheep, O soil of India. Those who were hunters arrived here to become prey. We know that absorption would come surely, absorption would come surely, that you would finally devour us like this, O soil of India, end quote. Now, I underscore the word elite in my description of all of this, since in this early phase of Muslim politics, Muslim politics was perforce just elite politics. as was the case with Indian politics as a whole, until about the early 1890s, when we began to see the emergence of some other strands of politics. And then of course, it's going to be really, you know, the Swadeshi movement in Bengal and then, and then nationwide, the non-cooperation movement, which are going to bring the masses into, into, into politics, into the public sphere. Sir Saeed Ahmed Khan, was concerned about the Ashraf, that is the elite, the noble, right, Muslims, and turned westward. The Diobandis, who commenced operations, as it were, with their seminary uh, just a little around that time, turned inward to canonical Muslim Islamic traditions, a knowledge of which they believed would compensate for the loss of power experienced by the Muslims. The first mass mobilization of Muslims in India was brought about by the Khilafat movement. Not the Swadeshi movement, because you don't see much Muslim involvement in that. It's really the Khilafat movement. Right? Gandhi's support of the Khilafat movement has often been one of the main criticisms leveled at him, but I am among that minority of scholars uh, who have worked on Gandhi for a long time, um, the minority among those who actually take a very different view and who, who think that, that Gandhi's intervention here was extremely important and prescient in many ways. Because what he was concerned with was trying to understand how you could bring Muslims into the public life of India particularly after they had become completely insular after the rebellion of 1857-58, for which the British held the Muslims more responsible than they did the Hindus. And so the Muslims were in that sense punished disproportionately. They were punished disproportionately in many ways. They were also, let us be very candid about it, there were also certain problems within the Muslim community as they are today. And one of them had to do with the whole problem of education. If you read Peter Hardy's The Muslims of British India, you will be staggered by the data that he gives because literally, I mean, I'm just throwing it out as a random figure, simply from memory, for every hundred Indians who went to college, as it were, who were matriculates 
only one Muslim was. Let's say around 1880, 1890. The ratios were just staggering, right? So what Gandhi was looking for was an avenue to bring them into the mainstream of Indian life. And the Khilafat movement, of course, became one such thing. Let us remember that for some time, at least until the early 1920s, until about 1923, early 1924, the Khilafat movement and the Congress-led non-cooperation movement displayed a remarkable synergy before the two began to diverge in late 1923. And then in 1924, you have some fairly fierce Hindu-Muslim riots, and Gandhi goes on one of his fasts. Um, in 1924. In the aftermath of the Khilafat movement, Indian Muslim participation in politics would be mediated by the elites once again. And that remained the case until 1937. So what changed in 1937? In 1936, provincial elections, the Congress did not do very well in Muslim constituencies. And this gave reason to people like Nehru to think about why is it that Muslims were not involved in the public life of the nation as masses, not simply some elite Muslims here and there, right? And so this is what, this is what um, Nehru is um, going to say, because uh, what's going to happen is that the Congress Working Committee is going to meet at Vardhav on 27, 20th February, 1937, and it deliberates over the question of how the Congress can get closer to the Muslims, how it can forge closer ties to the Muslims. And on 31st March, 1937, Nehru issued the following statement. He urged the provincial Congress committees to, quote, make a special effort to enroll Muslim Congress members so that our struggle for freedom may become even more broad-based than it is. And the Muslim masses should take the prominent part in it, which is their due. Indeed, when we look at the vital problems facing the country, the problem of independence and of the removal of poverty and unemployment, there is no difference between the Muslim masses and the Hindu or Sikh or Christian masses in the country. Differences only come to the surface when we think in terms of the handful of upper class people. This is a very significant statement, right? It is in consequence of this, and you will see that what I'm attempting to do, how I'm going to locate Shaheen Bakh with all of this, right? It is in consequence of this that the Congress at Nehru test initiated the Muslim mass contact campaign. That's what it was called. It's been almost entirely forgotten. I mean, you have to really search the history books to look for it, right? But that's what it was, the Muslim mass contact campaign in 1937. It was a last measure taken before the partition that was with regards to Muslim masses that was secular in nature and ambition. And the last phase of Muslim mass mobilization that was not communal in nature. Because thereafter, of course, there was Muslim mass mobilization, but that was by the Muslim League and by communal-minded organization by the 1940s and especially during the war when, of course, Congress leaders were in jail and the Muslim League cooperated, of course, with the British and, as a consequence, gained a huge dividend. That's the period when they really became important in that kind of political vacuum, so to speak, right? The Muslim League was able to occupy that space and its intensely communal nature is captured most infamously, of course, in the direct action day launched by Jinnah on 16th August, 1946. The Muslim mass contact campaign was placed under the direction of Kunwar Muhammad Ashraf. Um, there is an article by Mushirul Hassan, the late Mushirul Hassan in, the, in EPW, um, which discusses this campaign in considerable detail, um, December 27, 1986 issue. And Ashraf, who was also uh, one of Nehru's trusted lieutenants, as um, Musharrul Hassan reminds us, was asked to run this cell. Impressed with Nehru's language of Marxism, Ashraf accepted the offer with the feeling that, quote, we were on the threshold of a fresh mass struggle 
and the conviction that any honest and consistent anti-imperialist struggle led by the Congress would wean away the Muslim masses from the growing influence of Jinnah and the revived Muslim League. So how then are we to characterize? Well, of course, we know where that ended. We, it ended eventually in the Muslim mass contact campaign eventually didn't work, partly because the Muslim League, of, as I've already described, became by far the most dominant organization, um, especially in the you know last couple of years preceding um, um, independence. How then are we to characterize Muslim nationalist politics in recent times? There is one chapter which I cannot go over here, um, which is really almost like an anomaly in a way, uh, in Muslim mass mobilization in the preceding six, seven decades, uh, over a very short period of time, precipitated by the forced sterilization carried out under the administration of Indira Gandhi uh, during the emergency, uh, uh, at, of course, as we know, also at the behest of her son, Sanjay Gandhi. Uh, in Muzaffar Nagar, for example, which lies around 100 miles northeast of Delhi, some 50 people were killed during a protest on October 18, 1976, uh, nearly all Muslims, uh, and, and the subsequent police firing that took place at that time. But really, if, as I said, that is a very short chapter. Now, when we think about Muslim nationalist politics in the last several decades, we, of course, have to think of what happened on 6th December 1992 when the 16th century Babri Masjid was brought down, destroyed by a large number of Hindu militants who were moved by the claim that the mosque stood on the same spot where Lord Ram had been born. The mosque had to be destroyed on their view because it stood as an abiding and insistent reminder to Hindus of their humiliation and the fact that they had been subjected to Muslim sovereignty. I will not delve into this matter any further, except to say that the destruction of the mosque, indeed the Ram Janabhumi movement as a whole, had the effect of turning the Muslims of India increasingly to the Islam of West Asia or Arabia. This is a phenomenon that continues down to the present day. Of course, this happened in Pakistan, even to a much greater degree than it has happened in India. And in Pakistan, it happened, in fact, before Zia ul Haq came to power. Most people think it only really started the Islamicization. That is, I think, quite inaccurate. It was intensified under Zia ul Haq uh, in, 19, in the 1978 thereabouts. Uh, but it is certainly one of the things that also had a relationship, was one of the things that led to uh, the war over East Pakistan and the creation of Bangladesh. Right. So in the backdrop to, to Shaheen Bagh, I have underscored so far two things. One is, of course, the trying to understand the relationship of CEA to um, NPR and NRC. And secondly, is a brief history of Muslim nationalist politics, and particularly um, in, in the last hundred some odd years, and particularly the mass mobilization of Muslims. Thirdly, let us consider the last thing before we get to the Shaheen Bag movement. And here we look at the few image, the few years immediately preceding the Shaheen Bagh movement. And in the first of instance that I want to describe, the few months preceding the Shaheen Bagh movement, I'm referring here, of course, to the abolition of triple talaq by the BJP government in 2019, just months before the Shaheen Bagh movement. Right? How does how was this understood? Let me give you an illustration of how it was how it was understood in the United States. This is how uh, NPR, National Public Radio, their correspondent Lauren Freire was asked to comment on the fact that it seemed that in India, until this happened, a man could divorce his wife by saying the word talak, 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 thrice, in other words, in Arabic. And this is how she responds. That's right, a Muslim man could do this. A Muslim woman could not. It didn't work the other way around. And that's one of the things that some people, especially women here, thought was unfair. The practice is called triple talaq. Talaq is the Arabic word for divorce. This goes back centuries, and a man would only have to say talaq, 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 and his marriage is dissolved. And modern technology means you could even text it or say it over the phone for this to be valid, end quote. She notes that triple talaq is banned at, that, as, uh, that is in 2019, when 
when it was banned in India, that before that it had already been banned in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Egypt, among other Muslim majority countries. And then in India, it was only retained by virtue of the fact that Muslims are governed under Muslim personal law. She notes that many Muslim clerics were not happy by the government's abolition of triple talaq, but that most Muslim women were, she submits, and that India's Supreme Court had ruled in 2017 that the triple talaq is violative of the Indian constitution. Now, of course, it is a case that some Muslims see the abolition of triple talaq as a veiled attack on Muslim men, more broadly on the Muslim community. Some argue that the law should have been passed not by a Hindu majority parliament, but really only after discussion and sentiments from within the community. This is the argument which has some merit as in, in put in the abstract form, certainly, that reforms are much more successful and laws are much more successful when they originate, when the sentiment for that change originates from within the community at which they are targeted, whatever the nature of the intervention, putting it in the more abstract form. Right? The Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Act criminalizes triple talaq with a prison sentence of three years for men. So effectively, this act itself sealed the divorce. If a man goes to jail for three years, the possibility of reconciliation with the woman to whom he was married is, of course, considerably diminished. And I think the possibility of their cohabitation is certainly diminished. Let us also remember that the Quran allows for a three-month idat or waiting period during which a man may resume cohabitation with his wife. Right? What is important here is simply this. And this is what I think I would urge all of you to bear in mind in thinking about Shaheen Bagh. The supposition here was that Muslim women need to be safeguarded from their own men. And I think that you have to go back to the Shah Bano case. I would like to remind all the listeners of the Shah Bano case. I will go over it very, very briefly and then move on straight to the Shaheen Bagh movement. Remember that what happened in the Shah Bano case was, this was the case officially called Muhammad Ahmad Khan versus Shah Bano Begum and others. The Shah Bano went to court and filed a claim for maintenance when she was actually divorced by her husband, right? And she had five children and she files for maintenance under section 123 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, right? Now, um, the, uh, the, uh, 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 under, under Muslim personal law, uh, such maintenance is only required for the three month waiting period, right? This section, um, 123 of the Criminal Procedure Code, under which she filed for maintenance for long-term maintenance, puts a legal obligation on a man to provide for his wife during the marriage and after divorce, if she is not able to fend for herself. It's not a question of three months. If she's not able to fend for herself, it's like alimony for, for years onwards, she might be able to get that maintenance. Uh, Khan, of course, bon Mohammad Khan, Mohammad Ahmad Khan contested the claim, her claim on the grounds that the Muslim personal law in India required the husband only to provide maintenance for the iddat period after divorce. His argument was supported by the All India Mus Muslim Personal Law Board, which contended that courts cannot take the liberty of interfering in those matters which are laid out under Muslim personal law, and that this would be a violation of the Muslim Personal Law Application Act. The, the High Court ruled in her favor and that judgment was confirmed by the Supreme Court in 1985 when it stated that the Criminal Procedure Code of 73 applies to all citizens, right? This was viewed unfavorably by the then government, the Rajiv Gandhi Congress government, which had been elected in 84, and which then passed the Muslim Women Protection on Divorce Act 1986. This law overturned the Supreme Court verdict in the Shah Bano case and said the maintenance period can only be made liable for the Iddath period. Notice that what is happening here is that Muslim women effectively have no autonomy at all. Right? Everything, it's a little bit similar to 
what Lata Mani had argued apropos of the abolition of Sati Act passed by the British in 1829. The argument she made was, you know, you've got Ramon Roy and the progressive Hindus, and then you've got the orthodox Hindus, and then you have the colonial state, you have three parties. And what she argues is the three parties seem to be coming from very different positions, but in fact, they are all actually on the same page to use a colloquialism. Because the debate is nothing to do with women. It has to do with custom, with religion, with tradition, and how each party interprets that. So that in the Shah Bano case and other similar kinds of cases involving Muslim women, it actually has nothing to do with women themselves, with the Muslim women. Right? Oddly enough, that is to say that they're not anywhere in the picture. And this, I think, is what is the backdrop. There are other backdrops, two immediate backdrops, which of course included such things as, you know, in, when I say immediate backdrop, I mean in the months and two, three years preceding the, the Shaheen Bagh movement. And that had to do with, for example, the lynchings of Muslim men um, uh, accused of transporting cattle for slaughter, for storing court beef in their fridge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you might, some of you might remember the names of Pelu Khan. Tabrez Ansari, I wrote about him in June 2019. Um, Junaid, Qasim, Rakbar, Ali Muddin Ansari, Aklak, and others. And then there was, of course, also the infamous case of the eight year old Muslim girl belonging to the Bakarwal community who was raped in January 2018 in Kathua, 90 miles south of Jammu. An eight year old Muslim girl. And why was this case so? astonishing and so reprehensible what happened because huge demonstrations were taken out in support of the rapists and killers which included a hindu priest and his nephew and leading men of the village right so this is the backdrop in a way and this brings me to shaheen bagh and what I'm calling the gender of protest. The most remarkable feature of the countrywide protests against the CAA and the NRC surely has to be the fact that women took the lead in signaling their dissent against the heavy handedness of the Indian state and the increasing encroachment upon constitutional liberties. Perhaps in describing this as remarkable, I may be thought by some to be doing, if, an, if inadvertently, women a disservice in suggesting that they have not been prominent in previous civil disobedience movements. That is indubitably not the case. They were highly visible in the demonstrations that took place, for example, all over the country in the wake of the brutal sexual assault against Nirbhai, just as they were in 2004, when 12 women, the mothers of Manipur, stripped themselves naked in public to highlight the sexual violation of a young girl and more generally, the ongoing and systemic problem of sexual violence against women. But those protests and other similar ones were localized around the issue of sexual violence against women and largely brought forth women into the streets with the demonstrations often dispersing in days. Nor can it be said that Muslim women had any particular visible role to play in those demonstrations. The extraordinary courage and presence of mind that female students and indeed women from all walks of life have brought to the demonstrations that are part of the Shaheen Bagh movement signify a more enhanced role for women in Indian public life and point to the strengths they bring in steering India towards a more democratic future. There is a widespread feeling that the agitation against the CA and the citizenship amendment bill that preceded the act and now the NRC caught the government unawares. But I would also hazard the argument that one of the many things that has rattled the government, that rattled the government then is the resistance, much of it wholly unexpected put up by women. The status view in India has never bothered to expend much thought on girls and women, except in its paternalistic role as conferring benefits on them as a form of court empowerment striving to have them retain the sacred order of Indian womanhood 
and yet be emblematic of the modern working woman and so on. There have been countless poster campaigns by successive Indian governments enjoining the citizen to understand that quote, to honor women is to honor the nation, urging people to protect the girl child and suggesting that in the education of girls lies the salvation of the nation. I have never seen a country in my life which has more progressive posters and where less is done than India. Right? It has the most progressive posters just as, that, as it has some of the most progressive legislation in many spheres of life, including by the way, labor laws and far less is done in India than is done even in other countries with which it is often compared, including Bangladesh, which is now far better than India on almost every index having to do with the position of women, having to do with access to healthcare and so on. But as far as slogans and posters go, India is fantastic. Okay? However, even as the state has in this fashion offered a token acknowledgement of girls and women, even to the extent of offering its formal adherence to the view that the progress of a nation has to be marked by the progress of women and the attention given to the girl child, the highly masculinist conception of the nation state is in fact inimical to the participation of women in politics. Such slogans doubtless echo what both common sense and justice dictate as true. But the present protests offer, when I say present, I'm referring to Shaheen Bagh. Of course, it's no longer a movement that survives at all, but I'm speaking of it in the present because as I'm going to suggest, sometimes I speak of it in the present that there is something of that spirit, which I'm hoping is going to animate Indian politics. But these protests offer a more striking college of images of women who have stepped outside the enforced cocoon of care and plunged into the muddy and wobbly waters of democratic dissent. Photographs of young female students offering roses to soldiers may appear a little cliche to those familiar with the global history of protest movements, but Indian women have been bold, inventive, resourceful, and disciplined in taking the lead, setting an example for men to follow, and incapacitating the state from taking decisive action. During the protest, they held most interesting placards. Quote, my dad thinks I am studying history. He doesn't know that I'm busy making one, said one. While another simply said, PM 2.0 is worse than PM 2.5. PM 2.0, of course, refers to Modi's second term as prime minister. PM 2.5 refers to atmospheric particulate matters or fine particles, which have a diameter of about 3%, the, di of the diameter of a human hair, and are thus invisible to the naked eye, and moreover, once lodged in the lungs can induce chronic heart disease, respiratory problems, and death. So this placard said that PM 2.0 is worse than PM 2.5. This is all a reference, of course, to the horrific, indeed deadly levels of pollution found in Indian cities and towns. More elaborate was a placard held by a young woman who marched from Mandi House to Jantar Mantar in Delhi. Modi and Amit Shah sit around a bonfire in this placard. And Modi says, it's nice to have a little warmth in this cold weather, huh? And Shah responds, I'm so glad we started this fire. But women's protests have amounted to far more than all this. Indian women have shown the power of nonviolence. In mid-December, to use a phrase common to our times, a video went viral in the civil resistance movement against CAA and NRC, which have now become part of the international news cycle inserted itself into the global history of nonviolence. Demonstrations had been taken out by students at Jamia. Violence ensued, though the origins of that were of course contested. Three women students at Jamia, Aisha Rena, Labida Farzana, and Chanda Yadav shielded a fellow male student from being beaten up by the police. They can be seen in this, I'll show you the clips and videos rather than going back and forth, I'll show them together in just a moment. They can be seen remonstrating with lati wielding policemen coming between them and the male student and reprimanding the police for their unthinking brutality. In a very different demonstration, both of civil disobedience and an envious disregard, envious disregard for the respectability that comes from adhering to prescribed norms of social behavior, a student at Pondicherry University and another student by the name of Dev Smita Chaudhary at Jadavpur, both gold medalists at their respective institutions, expressed their firm opposition to CA 
at commencement ceremonies. Ms. Chaudhary walked up to the dais, shouted, hum kagas nahi dikhayenge, and then tore up the CEA in the presence of everyone before walking off the stage with a cry of Inkalab Sindabad. And let me here just show a couple of images here, and then um, we'll abandon the PowerPoint once again. Um, so here we are. So here just a few uh, images. This is one image you'll see many more later on um, of kind of the kind of scene you found both at Jamia and, and uh, Shaheen Bagh. Uh, read for revolution. Uh, this is uh, quite important um, because, uh, you know, the implication here is not only that education is really important. I mean, that's, of course, a very widely held kind of liberal kind of view. Uh, but I think in particular, uh, given, you see, as I pointed out when I was talking, you know, 20, 25 minutes ago, invoking Peter Hardy, looking at the figures for late colonial India and even present day India, as we know from all the data, that that proportion, even, even allowing for the proportionate difference, Muslims lag considerably behind other religious communities. Um, and uh, this is a, an image. Uh, uh, this is a photograph that I took when I went to, uh, uh, so I paid two visits. Uh, first was in um, December, 2019, and the second one was in January, 2020. Uh, to, uh, the first one was to uh, Shaheen Bagh, and the second was to Jamia and Shaheen Bagh. And this is uh, uh, the Zakir Hussain uh, Memorial Library uh, at uh, Jamia. And you can see here the, the slogan here. Um, uh, it's, uh, I want to underscore two words here. Sabi ka khun hai shamil yaha ki mitti mein. Khun, mitti, blood, soil. Think about that, right? Kisi ke baap ka Hindustan to nahi hai, right? Right? This is essentially what it is, you know, that the, the blood and soil of everyone are present. Uh, the, the blood uh, uh, is, uh, of everyone is present in the soil here. Uh, you know, it's not for anyone uh, to claim that the, this Hindustan is only theirs, right? Um, it's the Kisike Bap, the fathers. And here, that's the image I was talking about where as I said, almost a cliched image, you might say, because we've seen it in many other protest movements, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, roses being offered uh, by the students to the policemen. And this is that what I was alluding to, you know, the, the video that went viral. This is just a still image here where you've got three female students who are going to shelter this male student um, from the uh, policemen who are uh, attacking them, right? And this uh, is a video. Um, I think um, well, for some reason I had I had saved it as a video, but uh, doesn't seem to um, yeah doesn't seem to have registered as a video here. Uh, but this is a this is where this woman actually she's the gold medalist gold medalist, and so she it, it comes to the stage and she's going to just actually tear up the CA uh, and then you know leave the stage crying in Kalab Zindabad. It is, however. Most strikingly, the women of Shaheen Bad, a predominantly Muslim neighborhood in Delhi's Jamia Nagar, who exemplify the possibilities of nonviolent protest and who, in their actions, have rewritten the history of nonviolence. This colony was founded by Sharik Ansarullah, who is now 63, who came to Jamia as a student in 1979. Excuse me. He then went on to earn an MA. Um, as, uh, uh, in Arabic studies from uh, uh, JNU and, and then actually, I think, you know, earned an MBA or something like that and, and eventually started a company. Um, and uh, he and his family purchased 80 bigas uh, of the village that existed there in 1984 and they named the village Shaheen, which in Persian means falcon after a poem or nazam by Iqbal called Sitaron Se Aage Jaha Or Bi Hai part of a collection he published in 1935. The verse in question is, Tu shaheen hai, parvaz hai, kaam tera, tere saamne asman aur bhi hai. You are a falcon. Your task is to fly, to soar in the sky. Before you, there is a wide sky to soar high in or other skies for you to cover. They commenced, these women, there at first silent, 
demonstration against CA and NRC, the women of Shaheen Bagh, on the late evening of 15th December 2019, following reports of an attack by the Delhi police on the students of Jamia who had been protesting the CAA legislation. Um, <clears throat> so let me see if I can uh, move to the next. So here is a, here is a, um, All right, I'll stop this video here. So there are three short videos that I'm showing you, uh, which were shared with me by someone um, who was obviously uh, some, someone who shared them, who got them from people who were there. Uh, and these show the attack on uh, by the uh, police uh, on the library of Jamia. Uh, and you can see that was tear gas. And there's some, there's another video where you can see the <laughs> terrifying, uh, you know, they're just terrified and, and they're basically, um, so let me see if I can start this video. Um, <laughs> so, you know, entirely unprovoked, entirely unprovoked assault on the library where students were studying and the police are throwing tear gas. Um, and <laughs> so let me move to the last video here, uh, very briefly. It's going to go to class, you know, all of that, right? Uh, and you know some of these videos have students who are uh, some of the, some of these videos have uh, have students who are sheltering under the desks and all of that. So this is the situation that I'm describing, and this and I, I think the news of this passed on to the women of Shaheen Bag. Um, uh, this is also a video here, but uh, it seems again that for some reason, let me see if I'm able to. It somehow, for some reason, it didn't. Um, um, I thought it was done as a video. I checked it, but anyhow. So this is a this is a. I wanted to share here a video of uh, of uh, uh, one of the dadis of Shaheen Bag, uh, Bilkis Bano, and here she has a extraordinary one and a half two minute sort of uh, set of remarks directed at Narendra uh, Modi. Now these women. Um, of Shaheen Bag, following this attack, took to the middle of a main highway. Initially, they were the very first time they sat down. There were about a dozen women. They just sat down in the middle of the road that connects the city to Noida, and they sat dharna. So this is an old practice. Um, I can talk about that maybe in the q and I've done lots of work having to do with the idea of sitting dharna. Uh, there are men eventually did the same except you know over a period of days except that in the morning the men um, rose and went to work um, uh, the women have been celebrated as i said as the dadis or grandmothers of shaheen bag but the but a good number of them are also much younger um, and by no means are all of them homemakers by no means the women who have taken part in the movement are college students, but they're also businesswomen, lawyers, and doctors. Some came and sat with children, some without. The children played on the podium sometimes, sometimes holding national flags. The women often sat in rows. In the evening, some took their children home, fed them, and then would return to spend the night under the Shamiana. And these are photographs. The ones here that I'm showing you are photographs that I had taken um, in December 2019, uh, because certainly when when I was there, which was I think about December 27th, uh, 
the importance of Shaheen Bagh had already been underscored uh, to my mind. And so I had gone there and spent several hours um, and uh, you know, this was what I encountered. Uh, and so you can see uh, uh, largely, almost entirely dominated by women here. Uh, there were these ropes um, and the men were outside. So this, in, this uh, of course, inverses the position uh, that one would ordinarily find um, where men are taking center stage here, it was really the women. Uh, and the role of men is very interesting because the men, uh, you know, one thinks of course that these men are coming from, uh, as is true of Hindu men as well, and Indian men in general coming from patriarchal families. Uh, you know, the, the women basically take care of the home, they cook, they clean, take care of the children. Uh, here, clearly, the roles are going to be partly reversed. When I say partly, it's because many of these women still uh, thought that they were going to fulfill whatever duties they had uh, back home um, and, and, and uh, also come to the demonstration and often spend nights uh, as well. Uh, what you are seeing here is these are not all cla women clad in black, which is sometimes a dominant image uh, of the burqa clad woman, uh, Muslim woman. Uh, there is a kind of a festive air as well. So I think it's important to, you know, look at these photographs rather carefully. You can see little children as well. Um, and there you see the ropes and you see all the men over there, right? And the background over there. And this one shows you where the stage was because over time what happened um, <clears throat> is that every day uh, people would come to the stage and gradually celebrities started coming. Um, and I have to say that, you know, usually when celebrities come, well, that's the end of it, right? The, the politics has already been compromised, squeezed out. Uh, it seemed to me patently the case that that was not what happened here. Uh, and that somehow everyone recognized that there was something very distinct uh, about what was really happening here, even if people couldn't necessarily put their finger on what it was. Um, and, and you saw the usual you know, array of figures, Subhash Bose, Gandhi, uh, you know, Zak, uh, Molana Azad, Zakir Hussain, uh, Sarojini Naidu, etc. right? Uh, usual array of figures, Ambedkar, of course. And when you move out, then the dominant images were certainly, it seemed to me, Ambedkar and Gandhi, um, sometimes Bhagat Singh. Uh, again, that would all require an extensive commentary because uh, there has often been an attempt to bring Gandhi and Ambedkar together by well-meaning people. It's been a very difficult exercise. And in certain all of these, it was kind of done in a way a little bit more effortlessly, if I may put it this way. These were the kinds of um, um, drawings that you saw on the streets itself, actually. So this is the old game of snakes and ladders. Uh, and you can see the snakes, of course, are the are the are all the... Uh, uh, evil ones here, you can see NPR, right? Uh, the, you know, you try to climb the, the light ladder of goodness, the snake, snake tries to bring you down. Um, and, and here it says partiality. Uh, and here again, you can see Sangi. So the snake, of course, represents one of those who, um, uh, you know, is a member of the RSS, uh, Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh. Uh, that's what the Sanghis, sometimes Sanghis are also used more broadly to refer to um, the advocates of Hindutva, whether they're strictly in the RSS or not is not crucial here. Um, and here, again, some of the work that you saw, uh, they're far more extensive murals. I'll just show them later on at the very end, just so that you have a sense of some of the kind of art that was really generated there. Um, not all of the artworks have been identified, uh, but here you can see no, um, no CEA, no NRC, no and you know uh, NPR, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, here you see dictatorocracy. So here you see Hitler on the left with Narendra Modi. There'll be several other images of this kind that were uh, commonly drawn. Uh, and here you can see the backdrop of that. This is the larger mural that was uh, really or artwork that was done on the street. Um, and these, these are again, and here you can see a person on the street, so you can see, you know, where it was drawn. Um, resist, reject, CA, reject, NRC, right? Um, um, 
uh, we won't, we, I won't have time to go over all of these, uh, but this, these are all, uh, these are all from Shaheen Bagh. There'll be a next set of them, which will be from Jamia. They're, they're, you know, not that far from each other. They're, um, you know, 20, 30 minutes walking distance, something like that. This is the heart uh, with these paper boats with ink messages, right? Um, so this is what one saw over there. And here's another photograph uh, of uh, what it looked like, uh, you know, the festive air in, uh, you know, during the day, uh, particularly on the weekends. Um, by week two or so of the weekend, Sunday, 100,000 people, you know, might show up. All right. Um, now, um, what is remarkable, of course, also is that these women had no training whatsoever as Satya Gravis. I mean, the non-cooperation movement, uh, think of the Salt March. Gandhi handpicks, handpicks every single person of the 78 people who accompanied it. And these are people who lived with him, worked with him. You know, they know the ashram, they know the routines of the ashram, they know they, they, they're, they're proximate to him. They, they're trained in self-discipline. These are these women are not, the, and and the thousands of others who are going to join, they're not trained as Satya Grace. The movement has no leader whatsoever. This is something similar to what I was speaking about in my last lecture. Certainly, no leaders that you could talk to, and when negotiating teams, as it were, you know, when to talk to them, uh, let's say on behalf of the government, the, the the woman or two or three women who would receive would say, well, you know, we'll take this up with with everyone else later on, right? Um, so what are they doing here? They're basically relying on these networks that they've developed amongst themselves, which come from within the community, which are organic. And these are very crucial in being able to withstand the pressure that's coming from the police, coming from the media, social media, right? And just before the Delhi State Assembly elections from within the Muslim community, which was the elders of which were urging these women to abandon the protest, compromise to some degree, right? And they withstand all of that pressure. And for those of you who want to know how it ended, I can tell you how it ended, which was that the government made numerous strenuous efforts trying to use the courts to their advantage, exercising pressure through Muslim leaders, as I said, using social media to discredit them. These people were, of course, characterized. I mean, how predictable that the state would do it. Were characterized as terrorists, right? They would stand all of that. So how did it end? 24th March, 2020, in the evening, the prime minister announces a national lockdown to start at midnight within four hours. And everyone had to be off the streets. Every single person had to be off the streets. That was what the national lockdown was. And at 2 a.m. that night, when these women finally left, they had to leave. They finally left. This police swooped down, wiped out all the murals, took down the Shamiana, tried to erase every sign of the protest, of the movement in Jamia and Shaheen Bagh, right? So this is how it ended. But let's go back to these women because they're helping each other with household chores, taking care of each other's domestic responsibilities, visiting homes, babysitting, cooking, bringing children to the police site. See, what Gandhi had done was he had taken fasting from the home to the public sphere. Go back to Gandhi's autobiography. He tells you on the very first few pages, he saw his mother fast. A different kind of fast. I don't have time to elaborate upon this. I did a long lecture on this just a month ago for Flame University um, on the politics of Gandhi and the politics of fasting. But he sees his mother fast. And he takes fasting from the domestic realm to the political realm. The women of Shaheen Bagh did what? They claimed these public spaces and as an extension of domestic life, right? And they understood. Though some of them were illiterate, not all of them, as I pointed out, some were even in the professions, some of the women who joined the movement, right? Some 
might have been illiterate, but they were still aware of what it is, what is at stake in the government plan to roll out a nationwide NRC. They all understood that women are even more vulnerable than men. For example, most Muslim women do not have identification papers. Property papers are almost invariably in the name of men. And there is this wonderful video, which I have not been able to locate now. At that time, I had seen it, and I'm no longer able to locate it. I'm sure it's somewhere there, but I just haven't been able to find it, despite doing a, quite a search for it, where one of these dadis, not Bilkis Bano, um, who was then 90 year old, narrated in a minute and a half, as it were, seven generations of her family's history and their names and then asks Narendra Modi, can you do the same? Can you do the same, right? Ham kagas nahi dikhai ge. That was, which is, which is, you know, this is the, a poem that was written by the poet and comedian Varun Grover, right? Um, underscoring the importance of what becomes the identity card. Because if these women cannot show their identification cards can show the names and births of their parents and their papers, well, are the citizens. See, this is why we have to understand what the NPR and the NRC is. They understood it, right? That's what we're really talking about. So it is their very presence, grit and discipline resistance, which gives the lie of these women to the claim that the demonstrations were fueled by the opposition, as this government stated, or outside instigators. These women offered as decisive a repudiation as any that could be mustered of the specious claim that the demonstrations had been violent, right? Um, <clears throat> now, um, um, there are a great many other aspects which I would love to have discussed, but I think that we're already, you know, well past the hour. Um, um, and so I really want to wind up very quickly over here. Um, I do want to underscore the importance of this thing called the identity card. I'm going to just show you while I'm speaking a number of images, uh, which are, uh, as I said, either from the Shaheen Bagh or uh, Jamia area. These are still from uh, Shaheen Bagh, uh, where people would stand with, you know, little placards, uh, each describing, uh, you know, something or the other. Some sometimes even a poem. Um, and uh, there are very interesting questions. You know, how do Bhagat Singh, Gandhi, Ambedkar? Uh, other members of the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army, right? Uh, how do all of these people, uh, how are they all brought together, uh, you know, in this kind of uh, protest? What is it that the women took from Ambedkar? Because what is, of course, remarkable, really, uh, you know, if you think about the, about the women of Shaheen Bagh, is that they did not disavow the language of the Constitution, all right? See, these women that have were also at the helm of a non-violent affirmation of the constitutional promise of equality under the law. And I think it would not have come as a surprise to Gandhi, even though Gandhi himself, of course, championed the constitution, but he also realized there were limitations uh, to the constitution. But I think that he would not have been under any surprise at all that it is the women who are capable of doing this. Because Gandhi had been a keen observer of women in politics from as early as 1907. He writes his first piece in Gujarati on the suffragette movement in Britain as early as 1907. The piece is called Brave Women in their defense. Women were in his view naturally predisposed towards nonviolence, right? Though, as he pointed out repeatedly, it was necessary to make a distinction between nonviolence of the weak and nonviolence of the strong. Though here, let me be very clear, by weak he doesn't mean women and by strong he doesn't mean men. Quite to the contrary, nonviolence of the weak is simply those who have taken to nonviolence even though they would like to take recourse to violence. They simply don't have access to arms. They don't have the training. And he said this was true of most Indian men. Gandhi had no illusions about that whatsoever, right? So by nonviolence of the weak, he's not referring to women, but rather to 
men or women who turn to nonviolence, not from choice, deliberation, or moral reasoning, but from dint of habit, instinct, or simply circumstances. Women, Gandhi was convinced, could be the ideal satyagrahis, right? And what he was interested was seeing how they could generate a disciplined and systematic movement on nonviolent social transformation. And I'm saying to you, that is what Shaheen Bagh really is, okay? That, which, is, which is why I think it constitutes a fundamentally new chapter in the history of new violence, nonviolence. Let me once again reaffirm something though, namely that these women, even while they're invoking Gandhi, they're invoking Ambedkar, and they are sitting dharma, right? Which is of course not a, which is not a constitutional mode of redress, right? They're sitting dharma, what is equally remarkable, nevertheless, is that they simultaneously lay claim to the constitution or Samvidhan of India, to the protections that it offers and to the rights embodied in it. You could say they perhaps looked to Ambedkar as a repository of the promise of the constitution, just as it looked to Gandhi for the ecumenism they see in the Indian past. It has often been argued, even by those who are liberals, that we do not see as much as we should see Muslims denouncing Muslim communalism. Whatever the merit, if any, of that observation, the Shaheen Bagh movement is a ringing denunciation of Muslim communalism, as was the Muslim mass contact campaign in the 1930s, right? And if I had to go back to that image, of blood and soil, right? I, I said, I want to underscore those two words. I want to sort of end on that note. See, what the women of Shaheen Bagh seek to do is to locate citizenship in the soil and blood of the nation, in raising generations of the young, in weaving a web of social relations, in the idea of neighborliness and friendliness and much else. These women in Shaheen Bagh and elsewhere in Delhi and the rest of India speak of being born in India and dying in India. And there were Shaheen Baghs everywhere else too, right? Uh, I have a video, I don't know if, it'll, if it will play. Uh, I'll come to that and, and, and you know, more or less conclude with that. Uh, just quickly showing you some images. Uh, most of these now are going to be uh, the ones that are gonna come from, from Jamia, from just outside the university. Uh, these are still in Shaheen Bagh, uh, but the ones that are going to come shortly after this. So uh, these, this, you know, these will be available uh, on my YouTube channel. Um, but you know, you can see that you know some of them are taking, uh, are, you know, they're attentive to what these leaders have said, right? Dadi tum sangarsh karo, ham tumare saath hain. So here you have, you know, little little artwork where Modi says, "Kala dhan laenge." Sapko Pandra Pandra Lak Milenge, Har Sal Do Karod, No Kriya Denge, right? Every year, two crore people are going to be employed. Um, everyone is going to get money because remember what he said that he was going to bring back all the black money that Indians had invested in, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, in uh, uh, Switzerland, Mengai uh, Kamhogi, Bullet Train Lange, we're going to bring the bullet train. Uh, you know, inflation will be reduced. Uh, hundreds, uh, uh, hundred smart city. Banayenge will make hundred smart cities, and then uh, and then Amit Shah is there on the other hand, and he says, "Mere vaadon ka hisab mangna chodo. Forget about the promises that I gave you. Pale ye sabit karo ki tum log is desh ke nagrik ho. First establish. Give me proof. Offer evidence. Establish." whether you in fact are citizens of this country or not, right? So, so this, is, this is what you see in much of this kind of work. And here we're moving very quickly to what was called a library that was set up. It's a very interesting thing to talk about, but I'm going to just omit it here, just simply show you a discussion of it. Um, the libraries, or one way to think about the library here is also think, think of it as the first and most explicit rejoinder to the fact that the attack um, at Jamia was also on the library, actually. So here, this is a library being born anew with little children, uh, right? Uh, and these are the kinds of things that you would find 
uh, all over the Shaheen Bagh um, area, right? Um, so this is a point that I wanted to share with all of you from Mahamud Darvish called Identity Card, because what is the, what is this whole thing? The NRC, uh, and look at where India is heading, right? Voter ID card, PAN card, Abhar card, everything has to be linked to a mobile number. I mean, there, this is, this is a complete surveillance national security state, right? Write down, I am an Arab and my identity card number is 50,000, I have eight children. And the ninth will come after a summer, or will you be angry? Write down, I'm an Arab, employed with fellow workers at a quarry, I have eight children, I get them bread, garments, and books from the rocks. I do not supplicate charity at your doors, nor do I belittle myself at the footsteps of your chamber, so will you be angry? Write down. I'm an Arab, I have a name without a title, right? This is the poem by the great Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darvish. And here we have, this is a video, uh, I, unfortunately, again, as I said, for some reason, didn't record as a video on my PowerPoint, which sort of very quickly takes you to the other Shaheen uh, bags. Um, so uh, what I have described when I'm describing these women, right, who speak of being born in India, dying in India, that this is their land. They will go nowhere else. They have no loyalties elsewhere, and they are uniquely of the blood and soil of India. This is a far cry from what we can describe as the debates that animated Muslim elites, the controversies over Muslim identity as such, the relentless give and take of electoral politics and the jockeying for power. It is in fact a repudiation of all this for the affirmation of the idea that the only Muslim identity that matters, so to speak, is the one forged in India over centuries of experience and centuries of proximity to other faiths. The Shaheen Bagh movement may have drawn to an end, an end much desired and strategized by the Indian state, as I've described, but its spirit, one hopes, will animate future nonviolent struggles in India and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay, sir, for such a vibrant session giving us insights on nuances of historical movements, Shaheen Bagh movement, NPR, citizen, citizen, Citizenship Amendment Act, etc. Once again, thank you, sir, for lending your time to us. Now it's time for the audience turn. You can type in your queries in the chat box or raise your hands so that we can unmute you. Sir, there is a question uh, from the chat box for you. I will read it out. Mm -hmm. So the question is this, shouldn't Shaheen Bagh be looked at as a movement of the marginalized, the women, the Dalits, the minorities, the farmers, etc., against a patriarchal upper caste Hindu politics, given the history of confrontation within Hindu community represented by RSS ideologies spanning a century? I repeat, shouldn't Shaheen Bagh be looked at as a movement of the marginalized, the women, Dalits, minorities, farmers, etc., against the patriarchal upper caste Hindu politics, given the history of confrontation within Hindu community represented by RSS ideologues spanning a century. Yes, so the brief answer is that I think that I have, I have certainly suggested, um, I think quite insistently, that the Shaheen Bagh movement is unquestionably a great challenge to the Indian state. What is the Indian state now? The Indian state, after all, is run by Hindu elites. As far as I'm aware, that's the case, right? So the brief answer to that question is that, yes, uh, I think it is very much in that vein, but, I'm, but I think that that is too obvious an answer. You see, that is too obvious an answer. Because what I'm also trying to suggest is we have to understand the history of Muslim 
masses and their mobilization and the history of that in India. And I'm suggesting that this is the most significant chapter in that history. You, everything does not have to be connected to patriarchal upper caste Hindu elites. They certainly are the people that are behind the Indian state and the Indian corporate world, right? So I agree with that part of it, but I'm suggesting that we would have to look at something more. We would also have to understand why this is also in a way an affirmation of a certain kind of way of living in India that the Muslim masses have experienced. And that this is set against the history of how Muslim elites have defined participation in Indian life. I think that is an important part of the story also. That is what I'm submitting. So I would not disagree as such with the claim that has been made. In, in, uh, incidentally, just a little detail here, but someone like, like Bilkis Bano, uh, you know, that when the farmers movement started, she attempted to go to the border and she was escorted by the police back to her back to her home. So she certainly was trying to find solidarity there with the farmers movement as well, right? And so to that extent, yes, I, I certainly agree with the question, but I'm saying that I think that we would have to go quite a ways beyond that, you know. Okay, sir. Uh, audience, if you have any other questions, please do raise your hands or you can post it in the chat box. So let's wait for two minutes. Uh, Vinay, uh, there is a question uh, in the uh, live uh, chat. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is by Srinivas uh, ch from Chennai. Uh -huh. uh, he asks, uh, uh, do you find subtle differences between uh, the Hindu nationalism which continued uh, in India for the last 200 years and the present regime? Do you think uh, the, 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 the hardcore capitalism uh, yeah. refashioned Hindu fundamentalism in India? Mm. Yes, well, yes, I think that uh, uh, there is a difference. Um, I think there is a difference because, yes, I mean, the, the person who's posed the question is very much right. That the, I, I don't know if I would go back 200 years to the history of um, Hindu, Hindu nationalism. I, I mean, I think the person may be thinking of someone like Ram Mohan Roy, for example, um, who I would not perhaps view uh, you know, in that context at all. But, but anyhow, that's a, a trivial matter. Let, let's just suppose that, that we can trace the history of Hindu nationalism back to approximately you know, the 1870s, 1880s, uh, let's say to someone like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee uh, writing his novel Anandho Math from where Bang, uh, Vande Matram is taken. Um, so let's say 150 odd years, certainly 100, 150 odd years. Um, well, I think that there were certain kinds of anxieties at that time. Some of those anxieties are still here. So first, let us understand what is common. Um, I'm going to be very brief here. Uh, when I say anxieties, for example, some of the anxieties which had to do with the relationship to the West, uh, which were very much a part of uh, the, the thinking of um, uh, Bengali nationalists. Uh, remember that it's in Bengal, on the other hand, in Maharashtra, in Maharashtra, uh, that was the other place where um, we're going to begin to see the emergence of uh, Indian nationalism. I'm om omitting, by the way, this the narrative of 1857-58, uh, whether that was, uh, you know, that, that can be certainly viewed as part of the history, obviously, of, quote, Indian nationalism. But there's, as, you, as we, as I'm sure all who are historians, at least, are aware that there's a very considerable discussion on how that, that, rebellion of 1857-58 should be viewed because there were a great, great many people who took part in it, uh, who, uh, who really uh, took part in it for reasons that had very little to do with the, re the rebellion against British rule. Um, um, so just for the sake of convenience, I'm saying let's just take about 1870s, 80s, and I'm saying that there is 
a kind of an anxiety on the part of these Bengali nationalists. Uh, um, the anxiety, of course, stems from the fact that they ask the question, which every nationalist would ask, at least until independence, and I would submit, is still being asked, in a way, by the present regime. And that question was, why is it that we as a people have been colonized? And remember that the claim of the present government is that India really only became free in 2014, for the first time. Because after independence, then we fell under the rule of the secularists or the pseudo-secularists. The anglicized Jawaharlal Nehru, who is a completely despised figure among the present generation of Hindu nationalists in, who are running the government. I mean, if there's one family we know that they absolutely despise, it is his family. And he is despised. Right? So, the same question that animated Mr. Bankam Chandra Chatterjee, why have we as a people always been colonized? We've been ruled, you know, we're being ruled by the British. Before that, we were ruled by the Muslims for so long, right? And of course, what they tried to do in response was to create a martial past, create a whole history of our glorious martial past, which the present administration is also doing, by the way. Right? So we can point to lots of similarities. In that sense, it's not that different, but I think, yes, there is a different edge because that question talks about capitalism. Has that made a difference? Has the fact that the world has become in its own way, much more ruthless, partially because of capitalism, partially because certain kinds of restraints that the, e, that the historian E.P. Thompson described as the moral economy, that there's been a collapse of the moral economy, right? Now, I think that that does mark a difference between the present generation of Hindu nationalists and the previous generation. We can, you know, the, 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 the previous generation of Hindu nationalists, you know, someone like when I was growing up, we thought, we thought Atal Bihari Vajpayee was hardcore. Now, the present generation of Amit Shah and people like that, they think of Vajpayee as virtually a leftist. It's the same thing in America, right? Where once you have seen people like Donald Trump, then you begin to think that George Bush was actually a liberal, which is a laughable proposition, right? I mean, because we know what George Bush was, what we know what people like him were, the kind of war criminals that came out of that period as well. But they look relatively soft today in comparison to the kind of people you have in politics today. I think it is also, therefore, I'm saying, the question is a very interesting question, really. And I'm answering it in many different ways. But I would also say it takes a different kind of person to enter into politics today. Because I think the restraints that were also part of what was called the moral composure of a politician have com almost completely disappeared. And they've completely disappeared, unfortunately, in most countries. Right? In India, certainly, in the United States, in a great many. Okay. Yeah. So I, I hope I hope I've you know answered that question. Yeah. Biju, are you there? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. There is another question from uh, uh, Dr. Ayrushi, uh, how do you, uh, sorry, how do you uh, uh, see the state of mono-religious countries around the world uh, in the recent decades? Uh, are they getting more liberal or are they getting rude and uh, masculinist? Uh, may I ask you to repeat the question again? How do I see what, sorry? Uh, the state of uh, mono-religious countries around the world. Mono religious. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in the recent decades, uh, uh, and are they getting more liberal or are they getting rude and uh, masculinist? 
Well, I I think uh, I I think that you know uh, I would I would say that the there is a very the trend towards being liberal is scarcely present anywhere at this point, right? I mean, broadly speaking, I don't see that uh, in in any country, whatever the religious disposition of the people whether the state describes it as secular democratic, whether it's uh, you know, uh, a state that's theocratic, uh, whatever the disposition there, I think the general tendency is, I would say, unfortunately, far removed from being liberal. But of course, I think we would also have to, I mean, I would have to first really ask the person who's posing the question, what they mean really by liberal. I mean, we all know what the word means, but you see the word is now lost so much of its currency in, and it's so widely deployed in so many ways because I think that there are also some difficulties with the liberal position. Let's not forget that some of these difficulties have a very long history. And that history in part, for example, has to do with how liberalism became complicit with empire, which it was, right? Liberal, liberalism was really very much complicit with empire. So even liberal will not tell us really much about the disposition unless we have a better sense of what is entailed by that, you know, yeah. Uh, there is one more question uh, here uh, from Dr. Rahul Raj. Uh, uh, how do you connect all these, uh, your three lectures? Is there uh, an undercurrent of or a common thread, thread uh, which connects uh, the idea of dissent? Yes, well, I mean, I think the three lectures are connected. So I began, I began this morning's lecture partly in anticipation or really in a way of that question in a way, but also to set the tenor for the third lecture and to see how people could think about it in relation if they had heard the first two lectures, uh, that these studies and protest and dissent are not random studies in that sense. That in the first case, we're looking at Bhatshah Khan, we're looking at a historical case, but we're really looking at a case of a man who set up an organization, the Khudai Kidmatkar, which is really without parallel um, in history, in a way. And I began today's lecture by suggesting that we will have to think not simply of war crimes. See, we, we cannot humanize war. Let us be very clear about that. Let us not fool ourselves into thinking that simply by having international criminal court, having war crimes tri trials, having international military tribunals, having rules for warfare, that all of this will help us humanize war. No. War is a crime itself. It's not simply a matter of war crimes. War is a crime. And we are going to need something like a standing army of nonviolent resistors in every country. If I was in the policy world, this is what I would be working towards. Now, the second lecture was a lecture. So I'm trying to show what the thread here is. The second lecture was another foray into the history of nonviolent protest. Biju, there's a lot of intervention. I'm, it's kind of distracting. A lot of maybe people can be asked to mute. Uh, but so, all right. So the second lecture is a lecture where I was trying to suggest how the idea of nonviolence is being kept alive in our times. And in particular, I was looking at, you know, nonviolent movements, which really, in a sense, advance the idea because for one thing, these are mobile groups of people using new kinds of technologies, creating new webs and networks. And I was suggesting that there is a new semiotics of nonviolence. And then in the third lecture, which I'm showing in particular, how women, mobilize, particularly women whom you don't expect to mobilize, right? And Muslim women and mass Muslim mobilization has been very difficult in India. 
as a force for good. Muslims were obviously, Muslim masses were obviously come, mobilized in the 1930s, late 1930s, 1940s by the Muslim League, but that was communal, mob that was for communal purposes, frankly. How do we, how do we get Muslims and Muslim women in particular? who are at the forefront of what is really a very unique movement. So this is yet another way to advance the whole idea of protest, right? And in each case, I'm not simply looking at that, I'm also offering some general propositions, which is what I ended my talk today by a general discussion of distinguishing this from elite polit Muslim politics, talking about how these women relate themselves to the experience of being an Indian to the experience of Muslims over a period of centuries. The emphasis on blood and soil, for example, right? All of these ideas. So this is how these lectures are really linked in this series. You know, if I had to do, say, say the lecture series had said, you know, had required six lectures, I would certainly be able to do more because I can think of other ways in which I would think, for example, of what happened in the American civil rights movement and how that was another advance in a different way, right? Or the Myanmar movement can be isolated into a whole study by itself, but giving you the broad parameters for what I think are the ways in, in which we would have to see how the idea of nonviolence will have to be advanced in our times. I, I hope that that is something of an answer to the question that was posed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jenny, uh, are there any more questions? <clears throat> no, sir. Uh, there is one. Um, yeah, OK, uh, there are no more, no more questions. Now okay. I invite Dr. C.S. Biju, Dean and International Affairs for the concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Vinay, uh, uh, the, uh, actually we were uh, planning to have a discussion uh, as concluding remarks with Dr. Priya Nair, but Priya is not well and she's not uh, able to come to uh, join us. Uh, able, she's not able to join us. I'll just, uh, you know, this is two hours. And I'll just uh, make uh, two remarks and, uh, you know, we'll uh, finish the session. One is, uh, one important aspect of uh, your unique uh, way of articulating things, your uh, two, three lectures, uh, remind, uh, re reminds, of, reminds of me, like uh, Professor Richard Schechner uh, once argued that the tragic uh, outcome of street protests which actually went to the extent of one man horse a line of tanks in Tiananmen Square on 5th June 1989. And uh, uh, Vinay's take on the architecture and semiotics of street protest. I would like to describe it as uh, the East, uh, an approach to the aesthetics of, uh, of street protest, which include multiple ciphers, uh, in the people of, of the people against the official language of the state. Uh, second is another important, uh, another very really, uh, significant, sorry, uh, a, a significant uh, aspect of the, uh, the, this uh, three lectures, uh, especially the last two lectures, is that uh, they demonstrate, these two lectures demonstrate the process of transforming. Uh, space into places, uh, exactly what happened in Hong Kong and in Shaheen Bad, where the art uh, transforms uh, the space of Shaheen Bad into a place of political democracy in uh, contemporary India. So uh, with these uh, very small remarks, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, the concluding remarks. And uh, uh, thank you, Vinay, again, uh, uh, for your uh, wonderful efforts. Uh, to, to uh, deliver these three lectures, uh, which are phenomenal in uh, uh, the, the present uh, uh, situation and uh, which will have a spectacular role in, uh, in defining uh, our, our discourse on dissent in near future. 
uh, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Biju, once again for the invitation. And your last two comments, uh, uh, those two comments that you offered were very insightful. Thank you very much for the invitation.